Hi, welcome to the Bio 81 Tutoring Center videos. Today is going to be kind of the final wrap up things that have to do with evolution. Um, I kind of clumped three ideas together because they um, were kind of small. So the first is we're going to talk about genome evolution, bend molecular clocks, and then the three domains of life. So to start off, when we're talking about genome evolution, we need to talk about molecular uh, systematics. So molecular systematics, again, is using molecular data, such as nucleotide sequences in uh, DNA and the, the genome, to look at the differences um, and compare different uh, species or groups of species when we're making these phylogenetic trees or trying to uh, find these evolutionary relationships. And molecular systematics is useful for a number of reasons. The first is sometimes we want to compare things um, pretty generally, and so they don't have really any um, morphological similarities. For example, if we're trying to figure out the evolutionary similarities between yeast and uh, humans, uh, we don't share a lot of morphological characteristics with them. However, there are a lot of genetic things that we share with them. Um, the other thing is sometimes we are comparing things that we don't really have any fossil record of. Uh, for example, some prokaryotes, uh, they aren't stored in the fossil record very well because they were so small, so we can't compare them, and so instead we can look at their uh, molecular or uh, genome uh, data and use that to find these similarities. So two things that you have to be familiar with is orthological genes and paralogous genes. So orthologous genes are homologous genes that are found in different species because of speciesation. So that's kind of uh, self-explanatory, makes sense. Uh, two species have similar genetic sequences because they share a common ancestor, and so they both inherited those similar uh, genomes. Uh, Paralogous genes are a little bit different. Uh, they result from gene duplication found in more than one copy in the same genome. So what happens here is that uh, some uh, gene uh, in the nucleotide sequence or in the genome is duplicated, uh, and so what might happen is in one species you see uh, this one gene, in another species you see kind of uh, these six genes that are all very similar, and so maybe what happened is uh, they both share a common ancestor that had that one gene, but then it was duplicated and there were some changes in those genes. And uh, paralogous genes are useful because they allow for uh, more genetic changes because you now have more genes. Um, and so something interesting to note is that 99% um, of our genes are orthologous with mice and 50% are with yeast. So that just kind of goes to show that uh, most of life share many developmental and biochemical um, pathways. They're very similar. Um, even if we don't look a lot the same, a lot of the ways in which we work are very similar. So moving on to molecular clocks. Uh, molecular clocks are just ways uh, that we are able to make assumptions about the ages of when certain evolutionary events occurred. Um, and they're based off the assumption that some genes evolve at constant rates. So what we're able to do is we're able to use this molecular uh, data and uh, number the uh, number of changes in uh, a gene, and then we plot that over time um, in which we have these certain branch points uh, in the fossil record when two species kind of emerged. So based on that, we're able to kind of say, okay, um, here's how often we're going to be having these gene changes, and here's how often uh, we're probably going to be having these um, uh, speciesation events or some evolution occurring. Uh, but it, it can have some problems, first off, because we can have uh, varying times um, it takes for genes to evolve from gene to gene or from organism to organism. Um, and also, we uh, have natural selection acting on these genes, uh, so uh, it might be more advantageous for certain genes to change than others. Uh, and then there's kind of this idea of the neutral theory, uh, that much of the change that happens to a gene has no effect on natural selection because a lot of the genetic changes aren't beneficial or detrimental to the organism, so natural selection is not going to act on it because there's nothing really to act on. And so that kind of influences this because that means that a lot of our gene changes aren't actually influential. Um, and so then again, molecular clocks aren't perfect, they don't show us a perfect a linear timeline of when these changes are going to occur. They kind of are just a general um, uh, idea of when this type of stuff is going to happen, and they can still be irregular again because of that natural selection 
and that can even be more irregular because natural selection depends on the environment, and environments can change all the time. And so if we use more data, uh, and more genes, and more information, then we're able to create more accurate uh, molecular clocks because uh, with more data, we are able to kind of um, negate some of these uh, irregularities. Um, and so an example in which they did this was with HIV. They were trying to figure out when the H1N1 virus first kind of came into humans. And so they were able to use some data of gene changes in 1959 and kind of compare them and, and make a molecular clock on it. And uh, they figured that in about in the 1930s is when uh, this H1N1 uh, virus was first introduced. And so the last thing we're going to talk about is the three domains of life. So uh, early scientists classified organisms into two kingdoms, plant and animal. So they pop, put a lot of the fungi um, and some of our protists in the plant kingdom and a lot of the other um, unicellular organisms that could digest some sort of food they put in the animal kingdom. However, over time, they decided that they needed to create five kingdoms. Uh, they included a protist, a fungi, an animal, a plant, and um, the last one was called um, Monorea, which was kind of the prokaryotic kingdom. However, uh, eventually they figured out that a lot of these prokaryotic uh, uh, species were actually more different from each other than they were from some of the uh, eukaryotics. So they finally decided to make three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And so bacteria and archaea are both prokaryotic cells, eukarya are eukaryotic cells, um, and so they all share the same characteristics of having some sort of membrane, some cytosol, some genetic information. If you remember, those are the things that are required for a cell that make up all cells. And so um, archaea, though, are very different from bacteria. They sh uh, differ in a lot of their uh, pathways that they use and their, their structure and things like that. Um, and so what we found is that most of life on Earth has actually been dominated by single-celled organisms. And so it, it makes things very interesting and a lot of different species that we have are actually single-celled. And so there's one hypothesis in how um, these three domains of life came to be. Uh, is that we had some common ancestor, uh, some of the first life, and uh, bacteria diverged first, and then archaea and eukarya share a more uh, common uh, or recent ancestor, and so they're more closely related than to bacteria. And a lot of this evidence comes from our RNA. And so our RNA is what's used to make ribosomes, and our RNA is useful because it's um, a time in which it uh, evolves and changes. Its genome is very slow, and so we're able to um, track these changes from a very long time ago. Uh, however, there's still some questioning about whether this is the evolutionary relationship because there are some similarities between eukarya and bacteria, and so they think maybe um, bacteria, uh, bacteria and eukarya are more similar. Um, and so this is kind of because uh, some of it's explained with horizontal gene transfer. So we've already kind of been learning about vertical gene transfer in which genes are passed from parent to offspring. The idea of horizontal gene transfer comes um, that genes are transferred from one genome to another. Uh, and so in uh, Bio 180, when you were talking about bacteria, you learned about things such as um, uh, conjugation and transduction uh, in which uh, genes were transferred from bacteria to bacteria. And so this is potentially one explanation why there's some similarity in the genes between bacteria and eukarya. Uh, and so there's still some debate of the relationships that these two share. Some actually think it's more of a ring of life uh, and in which archaea and bacteria are equally related to eukarya and that eukarya uh, took things from both of these. And so the debate still continues. Um, and so some of the difficulty in trying to figure out these relationships is that uh, these uh, divergence um, in this evolutionary tree happened so long ago and so we have limited data. But as we continue to investigate and get more data, um, the majority of it is going to, again, be this molecular data of comparing these sequences. Um, we'll be able to better understand these relationships and maybe our ideas will change. And who knows, maybe in the future we will change the three domain system to something else. Because uh, that's how science works. We're always changing according to the data and the evidence that we have. Um, that is all for today's video. I hope it was helpful. I hope you understand uh, the genome evolution, molecular clocks, and the three domains of life better. 
Um, I hope you have a good understanding of evolution and are able to understand that evolution is not necessarily um, something that we have to dismiss because of our beliefs uh, and that there's a lot more to it than just we came from apes. Uh, thank you uh, so much for watching and have a fantastic day.